think about governance and don't forget that pricing at the end of the day is about people, our customers and our colleagues and our internal resources of an organization. Coffee's for closers only. So we've established my proposal to stand in principle. Now we're just haggling over price. <laughs> Let's see how much we're going for on eBay. I mean, it's the same as Dunkin' Donuts. Plus 15 times the price. Welcome to Impact Pricing, the podcast where we discuss pricing, value, and the familial relationship between them. I'm Mark Stiving, and today our guest is Marina Diaz, and here are three things you want to know about Marina before we start. She is the Senior Pricing Expert and Consultant at Comptera. She's been in pricing for almost 10 whole years, and she likes to read philosophy. She is a deep thinker. Welcome, Marina. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for having me here. Uh, it's going to be fun. How did you get into pricing? I'm start, I started um, as a junior pricing analyst at a company, but I really don't come from a management or within a background of economics. I studied environmental engineering. And in there, I started to understand that Continuous improvement, deming cycle applied to sustainability can have a relation when we start and when we are managing pricing within a company. So my first experience was as a junior environmental engineering translated to a company, uh, starting to work at the company and starting to have a blank sheet to work within the pricing, of course, with my bosses and the people who were in there. But it was from scratch by doing everything, strategy, processes, systems, and all the management of trying people to fall in love with pricing and people to understand the capabilities that pricing can give them and can increase also uh, into the business different metrics. So in the very beginning, you took a job as an environmental engineer, they gave you a product or something, and they said, here, you have to go put a price on it. Is that right? Not at all. So I did my master thesis and I was like an environmental engineer and I entered the company as an environmental engineering to start to work within an omnichannel perspective, more broader than pricing. But they understood that since I've studied a lot of mathematics, a lot of things that can be directly connected so they pulled me aside and said okay we have to structure something regarding pricing so you will start to work as a pricing project manager as a pricing analyst first nice. due to that's mathematics perfect. that's perfect and uh, and we actually i usually get a chance to talk to my my guests for just a few minutes before we hit the record button and we spent 30 seconds talking about art versus science and pricing and uh, and so it's so fascinating because you're brought in because people look at pricing as a science, right? You've got this math degree, and so it's got to be science, right? It's all numbers. And yet, over the course of your almost 10 years in pricing now, how much of it has become an art for you? It has been becoming an art from the moment that we start to think about people. And when we think about people, we think first on clients and how we can translate within the pricing strategy, the ability for our clients to buy more and more and more and to keep the brand perception. But at the end of the day, let's look internally. So pricing, it's about people who work at the company as well. It's something that when we start to do a change management within the pricing area, it will involve everyone. And it's a gut feeling for the majority of people, when we think about salespeople, online, uh, marketing, everyone has an opinion on pricing. And that's the bridge on the art side, the art from the perspective of how to listen to everyone's opinions, because at the end of the day, also the people that work within a company, they are the customers as well. So how to listen to everyone, how to listen to their experiences, to their shopping behavior, and how to gather these I will say, and it's not formal information, it's more informal information to the pricing strategy. And that it's an art and it requires us to be almost like psychologists because this ability to listen that is not listening through a database, but it, it's with our, with our soul at the end of the day, it allows us to see more than 
the data, more than ability of cross-checking tables and cross-checking information and having elasticities and a lot of models. No, it's the ability to really have the client talking to us and how to look at the price at the end of the day for a product and say, this makes sense. Besides all the forecasts, I know that this price for this product that can be impacted and impact a lot of things makes sense. Okay, I am so shocked to hear you give that answer. And by the way, I love the answer, but I am shocked to hear it. And here's why I'm shocked. Uh, first off, you are a mathematical quantitative type person. Secondly, you work for Comptera. And when I looked up what Comptera does, you guys are essentially doing data analytics for retail. Mm -hmm. And when I asked you what you're passionate about, what we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about price elasticities. So all of this says number, 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 number. And now we're talking about, oh, it's change management. It's, it's the soul of pricing. It's talking to different people. And, and you're spot on. Both sides are really important. I was just shocked that you brought that up first. So, uh, so awesome. Yeah. From my experience, that's, and, and I'm feeling it right now at Competera, although we have, although no, we have a pricing tool that is able to help retailers to grow margins, to grow revenue, but we do a lot of calls with clients. So we spend a lot of time listening to the clients and to be able to, together with them, to build the pricing strategy. And sometimes all the concerns and everything that is connected with the concerns, it's not only numbers, it's not only this need to grow for market share or need to grow for margins. It's almost internal doubts because they read a lot of papers from McKinsey, from BCG, and a lot of information is flowing on their minds. And sometimes they need to talk to someone who is able to design everything and to put in place a pricing strategy with a tool that is able to execute and support. And this is something that it's only, um, we are only able to do it because we are able to listen and think together with them and challenging the customers also. Yeah, I think it's interesting. And I hadn't thought of it this way until you just started speaking of this. Companies don't want to buy pricing software that is just a black box. They want to know that their strategy and what the strategy is. And yet in this world of AI and all this capability that we have, essentially we want to build a black box to say, look, we can help you make these decisions without you having to be involved. And so there's this real fine line that you're walking between black box and someone in the company directing the pricing strategy. So how do you walk that line? We don't pretend to have black boxes in a way that all the variables that may influence pricing are somewhere and not controlled by anyone. This is not the goal. The goal is to have science and to have processes and automation to help us with calculations and we have the assessment of how these variables can impact our pricing decisions. This is something a little bit more mathematical. But in terms of defining which variables and which type of, um, how can I say, ponderation, uh, which type of value they may translate into the pricing strategy, that it's something that from scratch we need to talk with people, we need to assess. Let me, if, if you allow me, let me build a bridge between this and the thing that we were discussing that I'm a little bit passionate about philosophy. If we think okay. about stoicism, we have the concept that for us to be happy, we need to have, be within an ethereity, uh state of mind. That is, we need to only concern about the things that we can control and forget about the ones that we cannot control. When we think about pricing, when we think about models, of course, as a company, we have a lot of variables that we can control and we have a lot of things that internally we can also measure. But data science and the ability to look at the world, look at historical data, it helps us to look at the ones that we cannot control. So I would say that we cannot be, we cannot apply stoicism when we, when we are working at our uh, daily business. Because it's something that if we forget uh, about the things that we cannot control, they will control us. And that's something that data science ha help us 
It's to be able to measure the impact of the things that we cannot control, but that we can influence at the end of the day. And the potential of the influence, it's something that we can learn out of the black boxes. But the black boxes are models, statistical models. So if we are open enough and curious enough to deep dive on them and sometimes to speak with the data science team, to think together with them, this is crucial. Not to have a relationship of they are a customer and or I am I a customer of the data science team. This is not the goal at all. The goal is to talk with them, think together with them and to build the models together meaning that at the end of the day, we know all the variables and we are able to understand the impact of these variables and how they can influence our price decisions. So I think that was a fabulous answer. Now, let me just toss out something that we have no control over and just tell me what you think about it and what you guys are advising companies to do. And mm -hmm. that's the fact that the world is facing inflation today, mm -hmm. right? Our costs are going up. Our competitors' prices are going up. What are you coaching people to do today? It's the ability to understand first the things that we can control. And by saying that, it's the way that we buy our products and our relationship with the suppliers. So first of all, the focus, it's on the variables that a company can control. But at the end of the day, let's understand and let's put the effort in trying to understand how this evolves how customers are evolving also in terms of their purchase behavior, if we need to click on different buttons and different buttons that increases and or at least helps to keep the interest by buttons, I mean promotions, way to communicate, investment on the digital marketing, but not having afraid on sometimes increased prices still on specific articles that are only not connected. I'm, I'm saying price increases not only connected with the cost plus strategy, but also from the perspective of assortment mix, still trying to find opportunities to increase price, having no afraid to do it. But on the others, the articles that generate price perception in there, invest on being competitive, invest on having something to the customer that can create value to them. But this is only from a price perspective, of course. In these times, in those times, we need to think about with a broader vision. We need to think about the company as a service. We need to think about all the things that can complement and to be able to be exceptional on those so that the price, it will be from the inflation perspective, the first thing that people will, that people will care. But if we try to complement with service, with after sales, with a lot of things, of course, this can try to minimize and create a trust relation between a company. And if we can think about retailers as an example and the final customer and keeping this frequency of purchase as a relation. So what I find so funny about the answer that you just gave is we often hear people, pricing people, consultants say, hey, we have to raise prices, so we should start to focus on value. So what are the services that we could provide? What are the other things that we could do and, and make sure our customers perceive our value? And, and by the way, I think that's right, but why don't we do that when we're not raising prices? Why don't we do that all the time and build a competitive advantage? It isn't inflation that should be driving that, it should be just standard business practice that should be driving that. I totally agree with you. I totally agree with you. And sometimes I feel like doing that within the inflation period, it creates a defocus on the things that we should be focusing right now. So right now, probably we should think about services and trying to improve, but not to look at it as, as something that, okay, we will invest our time and we will forget about prices and pricing communication and pricing analysis because we want to put flowers in all of our services. No, this is something, and I totally agree with you, that we should do for all the time, focusing about experience, but pricing should be something that we also focus on all the times, but especially on the inflation because it, it's, it's the first driver of the impact of the inflation in our in our PL at the end of the day. It's the first driver. 
and people migrate between brands, people migrate between competitors, people have the decision at the end of the day, but we have the power to influence. It's one of the variables that we cannot control. Of course, it's our customer's behavior, but we have the power to influence this through pricing. So we should focus on experience, yes, but pricing strategy and pricing processes, internal pricing processes are critical at these times and ability to decide quick and data science to support this decision, not a gut feeling decision. Does not make sense to have gut feeling decisions at those times. Yeah, I think it's, um, I think what inflation does is it makes pricing more of a priority because all of a sudden companies feel like they have to raise prices. So they're thinking about, well, what happens when we raise prices and how do customers uh, perceive that or respond or react to that? So I think it, I think it raises it in the importance level inside a company. But I want to ask you a hard technical question. You ready? You you're going to you're going to love this one, I hope. One of the things that that you wrote when I asked what are you passionate about? You said we could talk about pricing elasticity. I'm not a fan of pricing elasticity for lots of reasons. But uh, but here's the hard question for you. What if um prices around the world go up 10%? I raise my prices 10% and my demand doesn't change at all because it's just a product that people have to have and uh, and they couldn't go buy it somewhere else because everybody else raised prices and that's just what inflation did. What does that do to price elasticity? Because it looks like we've got a completely inelastic product. Shouldn't we now raise our prices 10, 10% more? That's, that's a question assuming that it's one size fits all, of course, because in here yes. you need to think about it all the mixes that we can do and all the substitutes and all the cannibalization effects that we can influence. But I would say that elasticity, it's not only, it's not only the behavior, although mathematically it is, okay, but it's not only the behavior of, okay, let's increase prices and demand will be stable or can decrease a little bit. It's not only that because a lot of factors may influence that. So if everyone increases the prices and the demand still stable, of course, if we look at a harder perspective, we can get a conclusion regarding elasticity. But other things are influencing that in terms of how the communication is being done by everyone, how the weather is going to be, how the war effects are contributing. It may not trans be translated directly to this demand and to elasticity concept as well, but for sure it, it, it influences and for sure it's something that although we cannot measure directly, it's something that it will contribute. So the relation of looking at the elasticity as a number and on this number, let's put in forecast, let's make a promise to our CEOs and to our, uh, all of the directors that we will sell this these quantities, this is not true. It's a number based on historical perspective. So as soon as we raise the prices, we don't know the effect. So we can try to simulate and have different scenarios in there. But things it will for sure change because some of the competitors may start to communicate vouchers, promotions, a lot of things, a lot of things within the social media that suddenly prices are not the top of mind thing. And it changed to, to those competitors and they start to feel that the products are elastic again. So it's a lot of variables that can uh, influence this perspective of demand and elasticity due to price increases or decreases, I would say. Okay, so uh, although I love your answer, I'm still not sold. Mm -hmm. um, so I think of price elasticity as... Uh, something economists came up with to talk about industries, right? So what happens to the uh, demand for gas when the price goes up 1%, right? And that's an overall industry. And, and I find that we use it in companies saying, what happens when I raise my price 1%, what happens to my demand? And and that doesn't take into account all of the things you just talked about, right? And, and so that's why I get so frustrated by companies using price elasticity where I'm totally okay saying, look, let's forecast what we think responses are going to be to demand when the following things happen, right? And, and so having 
the tool that says I'm going to predict demand based on my competitor doing a, a promotion, that, that's actually going to affect my demand when that happens. And I think that's that's a much easier way to think about it than thinking of it as when I raise my price, this is what happens to, de to demand. I would say that sometimes um, somewhere, somewhere in my life, um, uh, a CEO from a company where I worked, it mentioned that sometimes it's better to have a number. Can be not pr probably it's not the perfect number, but it helps us to structure at least to structure scenarios that rather than don't having anything. So I think elasticity is a concept that if we use the we if you, you we are able to use it wisely, we will get information from that. Especially if we combine this with the data science ability to work within all the factors, all the impact of the factors that can influence and be influenced by our prices, this generates value at the end of the day for a company. I totally agree with you that we cannot look at these elasticity and quantities that we are forecasting as a promise and project our P&L based on that. This is not something that makes sense, but at least it helps us to understand price perception, how customers can react and how we can impact at the end of the day how can we have our decisions being measured and our decisions based on scenarios? So it's something that helps to build scenarios and to decide and to create different combinations of variables and to be able to assess them, to have a decision that is not a good feeling decision, but it's not a promise and something that we need to say, okay, by dropping prices 1%, we will settle a lot of quantities because it's, it's difficult. We have, uh, it's not the relation, if we think about the retailer, it's not the relation of a retailer with the customer. It's also the relation of the retailer with the supplier. And it's a cycle. So that be, that influences. And at the end of the day, elasticity. Yeah, I agree with you. It's only a number, but it can help us to drive to, to, to have scenarios in, uh, in our hands and to be able to support our decision making. Okay, I will agree it's just a number and that uh, that if people know what it means, I'm fine with them saying, oh, here's where our elasticity is. I just think most people don't know what it means when they look at that number. So I, I think that's the that's the challenge I have. So yeah, it makes it nice. makes it makes sense. It makes sense. And mm -hmm. in that part I, I agree with you because you cannot touch it. You know, it's not and most of all it's based on historical data. So it's based on the past. And it doesn't take into account competitor reactions. It can. Un un unless we assume the competitor reacts the same in the future as they reacted in the past. So, nice. All right, Marina, we're going to have to start wrapping this up. This is fascinating. I could talk to you for a long <laughs> time. But uh, but first, first thing we have to do is we have to play pricing table topics. I warned you ahead of time. Mm -hmm. uh, just so you know, Marina had never heard of pricing table topics but I'm shuffling up my cards. You can just see the nerves on her face right now. Like this. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. But you are going to get the five of spades. Oh, well, this may not fit you, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. Don't raise prices on subscribers who aren't using the product. Let me just read it. Because it's not directly connected with my experience within the pricing. So it's prices on the services. Right. And so this is more about subscription businesses? Yes. Okay. But first of all, I think I can build the bridge here. I can build a bridge here. Of course. Yeah, because my bridge, it will be with retail, the ability to understand price perception from people that never went to our stores. And sometimes I felt, um, specifically in one of the companies that I worked, that we are measuring our NPS. We are doing a lot of questions on the pricing, how they feel like prices are being, how, how customers perceive the prices. But we 
did not care about people who never went to the stores. But these people knows the brand. Some, these people knows uh, the, the they know the brand. They they have a perception. They have an idea. And when you say don't, when the card says don't raise prices um, on someone who never used the product, I cannot disagree more because if people did not use it, we need to catch them and captivate them and to try to get their opinions, try to get uh, close to us. So we need to do pricing movements, I would say. I don't know if you want okay. to say something. No, no, no. That was just to say you made one minute. Okay. And um, by raising prices, we can we, probably we will hear a lot of noise and like uh, we will start to to read on the news that this brand raised prices, this brand are doing this price movement. So this is publicity. This is a way of reaching these people to generate curiosity. But at the end of the day, okay, we decided to do it, but we need to deliver value. We need to deliver experience. We need to deliver the perfect, the thing that people did not know they wanted, we need to deliver it. So sometimes raising prices and having awareness on this price uh, raise, it can be good and can captivate someone who'd never use our product because it will be able to get to know us Although the idea, the first idea will not be good, but they will get to know the company and the, we need to do the prep. We need to make sure that everything it's um, easy to translate between the value and the price that they will going to pay. Same for companies that are measuring the NPS only based on their current customers. They need to listen to the ones that are not customers yet and to be able to and sometimes to raise prices to create them awareness, but to to listen to someone who is not our friends, I think that it can create us access to help us at the end of the day to help us to improve and to help us to grow as well. All right. So you took uh, two minutes and fifty seconds for that, but uh, I love the fact that you tried to apply it to retail. So uh, excellent attempt. Thank you so much. Okay, now before we wrap this, I'm going to ask, oh, wait, wait. Uh, for everybody else in the audience, uh, if you want to play Pricing Table Topics, you can grab a, a deck of our cards off our webpage. It's at impactpricing.com slash merch. And so now, Marina, last question. What's one piece of pricing advice you would give our listeners that you think could have a big impact on their business? Pricing is about governance as well. And probably it's the most important topic when we start on when we are doing a price movement or a price improvement on our companies. Think about governance and don't forget that pricing at the end of the day is about people, our customers and our colleagues and our internal resources of an organization. Right. In fact, we started our conversation out with exactly that and all the different mm -hmm. people inside the company. Uh, and so making sure that everybody is bought in and, and they know what their role is makes a lot of sense. So, and that excellent. they are aligned. Yeah. Marina, thank you so much for your time today. If anybody wants to contact you, how can they do that? They can contact me through Computera. So uh, through email. I, I don't know if I can say my email. You can if you want, or we could say LinkedIn. They can find you on LinkedIn. It's Marina Diaz, and if you write pricing, probably you will find me. A blonde, okay. a little bit more blonde, but it's me. I promise <laughs> that it's me. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Episode 199 is all done. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this, would you please leave us a rating and a review? Uh, the easiest way is if you go to ratethispodcast.com slash impactpricing. And finally, if you have any questions or comments about the podcast or pricing in general, feel free to email me, mark at impactpricing.com. Now, go make an impact.